Good morning. All right. Nine participants. That's great. So I will, uh, shortly after this video, I will put up the, uh, the actual assignment. I apologize. I haven't done that yet. So we're doing uh, the antebellum and uh, anti before bellum, right? The Latin for war uh, before the Civil War. Uh, antebellum westward expansion. All right. That's what we're doing this week. So let's see here. And it is an argumentative fashion. And the, uh, the narrative, what I want to do is I want to both uh, cover like a basic narrative of westward expansion before the Civil War, uh, just hitting the basics. And then uh, I want to address from the argumentative assignment, obviously, a, um, a very common and historically popular and uh, I think no matter how um, credible you find it to be or not, uh, at least a bit thought provocative uh, thesis uh, by a, a gentleman named uh, uh, Turner, Frederick Jackson Turner and his thesis of the West. So um, well, I'm wondering if I should the order I want to do this in. I know I want to do the narrative first uh, and then go over, uh, you know, an evaluation and analysis of his um, thesis. No problem, Claire. Thank you for letting me know. All right. Let's see here. All right. I have the nine of you. So we'll go ahead and, um, and share this screen, okay? So right here, actually, firstly, firstly, sorry. Let's look at the, uh, the assignment itself. So notice what I have here. Frederick Jackson Turner's thesis merits or deserves, right, consideration. Okay, so obviously I go over what that thesis is, and then I try to uh, defend it, all right? We're going to do uh, both today. Uh, we're going to look for evidence that might seem to support it, as well as evidence that seems to contradict it or challenge it, all right? And um, the, the um, second one goes against Turner's thesis, right? And in light of Anglo-Hispanic relations, in the early through mid 1800s, uh, particularly in the West, right? That in light of, of, of that basic narrative of how Anglos treated Hispanics, uh, Turner's thesis ought to be uh, reconsidered. It ought to be uh, questioned, all right? So that's what we're looking at with number two, as soon as I have this posted, okay? So, uh, what is Turner's thesis? I, I kind I tried to uh, give my interpretation to it here on uh, my page of notes. So I put here right. Might be a little difficult to see. Let's see if I can. Um, come on. There we go. All right, so Turner's thesis, he contends basically that the westward movement of settlement by the United States, right, restored or secured American meritocracy to which we owe our identity. So remember meritocracy, right, like merecer in Spanish, uh, to merit something is to earn it, it's to deserve it, it's to work for and achieve it of your own will your own talent, right? So we, uh, that, you know, that was part of the Scottish and French Enlightenment, as you may recall. Uh, that's part of classical liberalism that's going on in the 1800s, like with guys like John Stuart Mill, and they want the government to, uh, to facilitate as much freedom as possible, but also as much equality of opportunity as possible. So notice I didn't say equality of condition, 
right? Where, whereby everyone uh, is in the same, you know, uh, uh, level uh, socioeconomically, but merely that everyone has the same opportunity to rise or fall according to his or her own talents, hard work, et cetera, right? So it stands to reason, for instance, right, that um, meritocracy uh, oftentimes is in line uh, people that are that are pro capitalism are for meritocracy, right? They're for um, they they boast of capitalism uh, promoting, you know, a, a a level playing field for everyone, and we're proud of that. And to which, of course, Turner uh, ties our national identity because we're a very diverse country, right? Uh, ethnically, nationally, uh, culturally, and um, so to him, that's a unifying factor uh, to Americans and what he might, he might say constitutes Americana, right? What America stands for is equality of opportunity. And to him, it was fallen by the wayside on the Eastern seaboard. And um, it was revived in the West. When we, when we um, took over the West, uh, it was inadvertently um, uh, revived. Okay, so are there any questions so far? You guys okay? All right. So uh, what I want to do now is I'll, I'll go ahead and give like a basic narrative and notes, okay, on, uh, on westward expansion. So notice, right, in the 1820s, what was really big was public discourse on the mountain man because at that time right fur trapping was huge uh in the 1820s uh you literally got to a point in which uh you could uh, kill a beaver uh in an american river and sell its pelt in china for 800 percent profit i kid you not so hats and jackets became in vogue and, uh, and fur just took off. And so the fur trapping business uh, was encouraged uh, here in the West. So amongst some of the first famous ones, right? Uh, beginning in the, you know, probably arguably primarily the 1700s, uh, you had monopolies that were granted uh, from Russia uh, to, to Russian fur traders and fishermen. Um, to uh, from uh, Spain, of course, uh, to Spaniards, right? And uh, the British, right? The English had uh, some famous uh, fur trapping and fishing companies as well. So they started with monopolies, right? And a lot of them uh, came from Alaska and here the old Pacific Northwest. Uh, the, the Russians had Fort Ross here at the top of California. Uh, the um, uh, the British took over uh, or began to uh, infiltrate Oregon territory here in present day Washington, Oregon, Washington, and um, Idaho. All right. And um, by the 1820s, okay, I would make the argument that, uh, that fur trapping, right, um, became uh, more in line with capitalism or slash free enterprise as opposed to mercantilism with monopolies. Okay, so that's one thing I would contend. So you look at the, um, the 1820s and um, geez, for instance, right, uh, there was a, a gentleman named uh, Manuel Lisa. Uh, this guy, uh, this Spaniard, right, he began advertising on the American East Coast uh, for laborers uh, to try to come and, um, and work for his company. So notice, right, uh, the, the companies began to lose 
their kind of national chauvinistic flavor, if you will, uh, the Russians against the British, right, against the Spanish. And now it became a, a bit more of a free for all. It became more um, uh, cosmopolitan, where you had uh, laborers under the Brits, uh, the British company, you know, that, that were not uh, Brits themselves. You had people going independent, like Manuel Lisa. And, um, and hiring an, an international group of laborers, right? To him, it didn't matter uh, their, their color, stripes, uh, nation of origin. Uh, if they could help him uh, procure wealth, he was for hiring them, all right? So I, I think he's emblematic of this change, uh, this manual Lisa, if you wanted to look more into him. Uh, also, uh, of course, Robert Stewart. Robert Stewart, uh, was working for the British in Oregon, and um, he went back on a trip uh, across uh, the United States, back to the East Coast from Oregon Territory. And a lot of people believe from the, uh, the notes uh, that were taken in his diary, uh, which of course ended with a famous book or biography uh, that was written about him, uh, it pretty much presaged, it pretty much was, was uh, uh, synonymous to the later Oregon Trail that he took, of course, backward, right? Uh, he took from west to eastwardly um, instead of from the east westwardly. So Robert Stewart, right, he, he went on a trek and um, what he did is he sold the rights of his story, basically. He offered his story uh, to a, uh, a journalist in, I believe it was St. Louis, Missouri, uh, because Missouri tended to be like the will later become by the, the mid to late 1840s, uh, the launching point from the east uh, to the west with the, the main overland trails of the, the Oregon Trail, which branched off into the Mormon or California Trail, and then the separate, uh, but starting at a pretty fairly close proximity, uh, the Santa Fe Trail to the south. All right, and you have pictures of those trails um, on the assignment itself. There's a map with them. So uh, Robert Stewart, he took a trek, uh, they wrote of it, right, uh, into a bi biographical book, and it became like a big bestseller, and people were just enamored with, with all of the, um, you know, people liked uh, the exotic nature, right, the, the, the drama that was inherent uh, in his story. So for instance, at one point, uh, they were so thirsty that some uh, drank their own urine, uh, at one point, they became so hungry that they almost drew straws uh, as to whom to kill and eat. Um, at another point, uh, it, more than once, like with the Crow Nation, for instance, uh, they were extorted by Native American tribe uh, tribes that said, you know, basically give us this, this, and this, or else we'll kill you and take it all for free, uh, you know, now. And so they were extorted by Native American tribes. Uh, they went through great tr uh, trouble uh, getting around or through mountain passes uh, because of their fear of Native Americans uh, in the, um, with the Mandan Mountains, etc. So just you name it, all the stereotypical hardships, right, that, that, that have been associated to this day with the Oregon Trail right? Uh, disease, right? Uh, cholera, typhoid, fever. Uh, that, was, that was the number one uh, cause of death uh, in the West, uh, supposedly, statistically. Then you had accidents. And, you know, you have some great topographical marvels going across the West. Uh, the Great American Basin and Plateau, you could have, um, you, you could, you could, you could easily uh, fall prey to dehydration, right? Uh, certain tribes there uh, attacking. Um, of course, the, um, the, the Mandan, the Rockies, uh, the Sierra Nevada mountain ranges uh, had all kinds of troubles that were associated with them, uh, with flora, fauna, Native Americans, of course, weather, uh, geographical obstacles, uh, et cetera. Like oftentimes just in the Sierra Nevada alone, right? It, it averages about 1300 feet. And there you are in a Conestoga wagon trying to get over 
uh, this area. So uh, thank goodness for that generation. You had some people who became famous, right? Uh, for uh, finding shortcuts, right? Finding passes uh, through uh, the mountain ranges, uh, which would greatly facilitate. I mean, obviously the, uh, an exaggerated case might constitute the, uh, the Donner Party, right? If they had just been able to make it through the gap in the Sierra Nevada, uh, to which they were so close. Um, you also had, um, I would make the argument, speaking of which, uh, Jedediah Smith, right? Jedediah Smith and the other mountain men, right, associated with this, uh, they're going to become American heroes, uh, symbols of rugged individualism, uh, symbols of rags to riches, kind of a, a Rousseau going back to the Enlightenment, right, when, and Benjamin Franklin, uh, just uh, curiosity uh, with that which is savage, that which is 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 the opposite of, of, of what we think is um, synonymous with civilization, going out into the into the woods, right? And uh, you know, especially in the 1820s, you're going to have the beginnings of like the uh, the Romantic movement back in Europe, as a philosophical and artistic and musical movement. And they were it was against the Enlightenment. They they wanted to go for um, that which was natural, that which was emotional, that which was raw. Uh, that which evoked your passions, your fear, your terror, your sense of awe. And so they, they loved hearing stories about the Rocky Mountains, right? Uh, about the Columbia Snake and Platte Rivers and the dangers therein. About the Crow uh, and the, um, you know, a myriad of other tribes, uh, Shoshone, uh, who attacked uh, settlers trying to pass through. And then, of course, about these mountain men, right? Uh, the original ones who received, um, you know, press coverage, but not to the same extent as far as it having a direct effect on, on population movement, uh, were the French fur trappers, right? Uh, I'm going to butcher this, but the, uh, the Courrier de Bois, the, the runners of the forest, as they were, they, the euphemism was in French, uh, they were the first famous ones, right? But like I said, 1820s, because fur as a commodity is going to take off as a fashion product. And because of these American stories of people like Jedediah Smith, Kit Carson, right, uh, Tom Bridger, um, uh, these other big names, uh, John C. Fremont, uh, they're, they're going to really popularize the West and in, in its exotic, dangerous uh, nature, right? and all the opportunities and dangers that are inherent in it. So Jedediah Smith, right, he, um, he quote, discovered uh, the South Pass. And that was a, a gap in the, uh, the Rocky Mountains, right? So that's going to happen. And so that's going to facilitate, obviously, um, you know, um, uh, knowledge uh, of 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 getting getting through uh, more effectively, etc. Okay, so let's see here. So we have Manuel Lisa. So notice I'm I'm listing individuals that I believe are symbolic of something bigger than themselves. So Manuel Lisa, with the fact that the fur trade and um, and employment in the West uh, in the fur trade and fishing, etc., became more democratized, if you will, became more cosmopolitan of people from all nations and stripes, uh, encouraged, right, uh, economic ventures there. Robert Stewart enlisted the, uh, the fascination of, of Americans on the East Coast uh, with the dangers and the exotic nature of the West, right? Jedediah Smith is gonna help facilitate knowledge of how to get more safely uh, through uh, uh, into the West, all right? And so, uh, so for instance, by the 1840s, okay, you're going to have um, missionary movements. A lot of money is going to be raised, uh, in particular, uh, by by two denominations of Protestant Christianity that prided themselves on being uh, democratic, on being, uh, you know, uh, the religion of the people, of the common people. So, for instance, something as symbolic as uh, their, their preachers, uh, they began hiring preachers 
who did not have much, if hardly any, um, actual uh, educational background and credentials. And whereas with the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists, right, and the Episcopalians that morphed from the Anglicans, right, when we broke free from England, they, it was a, a matter of, uh, you know, a rite of passage that they would go to the Ivy League schools and, and be trained in seminary, et cetera. So to, uh, and by the way, the denominations, right, uh, the primary denominations are the Baptists and the Methodists. So they were, they were more egalitarian, right, in the type of demographics that they went after. They went after Western frontier, poorer people, Southerners, right? They took off in those regions. Uh, the Scots-Irish, right, that we talked about last class uh, as being seen as a kind of an underdog demographic and immigrant group. Uh, they, uh, they were proud of the fact, right, that they were, that many of their pastors were, were just simply men, common men who were filled with the Holy Spirit and didn't need any Ivy League connections, et cetera, uh, to be able to preach from the Bible, right? And um, so that's something to consider. Also, they, they went away from predestination that a lot of the older, more established denominations adhere to. And so, uh, you know, that's that too is more egalitarian, right? It's instead of saying that God is already predestined, who he's going to forgive and save and who he's going to leave to, to be punished for his or her sins to damnation, right? They're saying uh, salvation is open for everyone, right? So a big figure at this time is uh, Charles Finney, F-I-N-N-E-Y. And we'll get probably a little bit back to him. So they claim to be more egalitarian as, as denominations. And they, in particular, are going to raise a lot of money and send people uh, to, to Oregon in particular, uh, uh, to, to Oregon country, to try to engage in, um, in proselytizing and converting, uh, the, particularly the Native Americans, right? What's interesting is by the 1870s, they're going to continue to send missionaries to the West, I kid you not, um, to try to, uh, to save uh, the rough and rowdy demographic of, of Californian gold rush migrants and their next generation, et cetera, right? And that people use that to try to adhere to Turner's thesis and saying that um, that's evidence of how wild the West truly was, right? And that, um, you know, missionaries were sent there as if it were a, a quote, uncivilized country. So at any rate, the missionary movements, uh, they just, they had some big leaders they, they raised a lot of money. They utilized a lot of publicity, right? And uh, especially with the deaths of um, uh, Marcus of Marcus and Narcissa Whitman. Uh, they, Narcissa Whitman kept a diary. Um, they kept close correspondence with their constituents of the East, right? Uh, whom they were representing as missionaries in the Oregon Territory. And unfortunately, uh, the, the Native Americans began to fall prey in large numbers to disease, uh, to which, you know, of course it was inadvertent, it wasn't deliberate, uh, but to which they were correct, they attributed to the white people, right, having brought it to them. And so they came and slaughtered the Whitman family. And her diary and, her, and his or her correspondence back with their church leaders, right, uh, was put into the hands of, of a couple writers, and again, they 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 uh, they published some wor a work or two on it, and it was widely read, right? And so it kind of enlisted the cause. It kind of made martyrs out of them, right? And said that there needs to be uh, a movement uh, to the West to spread Christianity. So notice what I'm doing right now is I'm just giving a narrative as to the alleged, you know, causes and and instances in which uh, Americans began in number, in significant numbers to move to the West, to the far West, okay? That's all I'm doing right now. Um, so yeah, so to me, Marcus and Narcissa Whitman are kind of symbolic of that. And then by the 1840s, right? I would say also that um, the uh, two expeditions 
are are going to get a lot of attention. Um, so you have the uh, the Whitman Spalding expedition uh, to Oregon. And the gentleman that allowed them in was a guy named McLaughlin. McLaughlin, right, was a Canadian Brit who was in charge as a military governor over Oregon territory. And we don't have time to get into, you know, jurisdictional issues with Native Americans, but England by now was claiming the Oregon territory by way of her infiltration economically uh, through her, uh, her fur trapping and fishing companies and monopolies, right? So now they, there's a military governor over the region. And what he's going to do uh, is he allows Americans, right, uh, into the Willamette. I don't think it like William, I, I think it's without an I. Sorry, I'm a terrible speller, but I think it's that spelling. He's going to allow Americans to settle in large numbers into the Willamette Valley. And remember, right, Americans already were trying to carve their own area in Oregon uh, through, um, this is after the incident of Astoria. And remember, John Jacob Astor uh, was a German immigrant into the U.S., and he has a great kind of rags to riches uh, story, right? of uh, through entrepreneurial, through starting a business uh, in fur trapping, uh, he's gonna he's gonna accumulate. Uh, at one point, uh, people uh, referred to him as the literally the wealthiest man, or amongst the wealthiest men in the country. So uh, named after him, of course, Americans are gonna begin to kind of carve out an area within uh, British claimed Oregon territory in Astoria. And now they're, they're settling in large numbers into the Willamette Valley by the permission of the British governor, McLaughlin, all right? And so um, then in addition to that, you had um, the, uh, oh, don't fill me now, the Bidwell and Bartleson group. And notice these are just the names of the leaders, right? The last names of the leaders of these, um, of these groups. And they came into Mexican California. And again, right, they were allowed in Oops. Mariano, Guadalupe, Vallejo, that Vallejo is named after, right? Can you please scroll up so we can read the rest? Sure. Thank you. To finish my thought here, huh? let's see here. So Sacramento Valley, under the supervision of Johann von Suter, which we know as John Sutter, right? A Swiss immigrant man of wealth. So, uh, so notice, right, before I, I scroll back up real quickly here, okay, is the Bidwell Bartleson group, as well as the Whitman Spalding group, they were seen as innocuous, first of all, when they came across in the early 1840s, right, to the governor in, in, in uh, you know, English uh, Oregon, to the, uh, the comandante of the troops, of uh, Vallejo of Mexican California. They did not seem harmful or, or uh, threatening at all. They constituted a lot of families with women and children. They established schools. Uh, they, a common uh, adjective that was used for them, right, in a positive light was enterprising, right? That they were, uh, they were bringing with them, right? Um, they were bringing with them uh, a lot of skills, uh, that 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 could just enhance economically uh, the region. Okay, so um, remember though when you asked me to 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 go back up. Okay, remember we're going to go back over this. I I, uh, I apologize, but I'm I'm skipping this for now, and I'm going to go back to it. Okay. Because yeah, this is Turner's thesis. I wanted to give a narrative first. 
and then go back into the arguments for and against Turner's thesis, if that's okay. Because I'd like you to be armed with the data first. So we'll go back to that. Um, so yeah, so that was a common uh, adjective used uh, for these settlers coming into uh, Mexican, California and Oregon. And what, what some historians, conflict historians allude to, right? Is they refer to these expeditions as the Trojan horse, as you might know, right in the Aeneid, uh, the, the, the Mycenaean Greeks uh, utilized a Trojan a horse as an alleged gift to the Trojans, right? So that they could put their, their guard down, right? And allow that, tro that Trojan horse into through Priam's gates that, and walls that they were unable to scale, right? So that in the middle of the night, soldiers could come out of the horse and, and slaughter them in the Trojan War, right? And so uh, that's metaphorically what some people refer to these expeditions that, okay, great. They, they were kind of harmless. Uh, they brought enterprise with them, right? Uh, but the thousands that came after them, after they opened the gate up, uh, were not such, were far from such, okay? So that's, that's part of the common narrative of the 1840s uh, going into uh, the far west. You also have federal subsidization of westward uh, travel in the 1840s. So remember, uh, the, uh, the Fifth Amendment says uh, the American government is to protect the life, liberty, and property of Americans. So the generation of the 1840s, right, you had senators uh, like Thomas uh, Hart Benton, B-E-N-T-O-N from Missouri. And they really lobbied and pushed for westward expansion and for the government to help facilitate that westward expansion, right? So the Fifth Amendment, right? And so now you're going to have um, federal forts that are established, right, along the overland trails. You're going to have um, literature and maps and supplies provided at key destinations, right? Along the Oregon Trail, for instance, in particular, that the government is going to try to facilitate and help, right? And um, in some cases, they sold the supplies and made money from it. And in other cases, they, they gave them out. They also brought um, let's see here, uh, telegraph and post office uh, communication across the West, right? So with the telegraph wires of the 1840s, where they would use the Morse code, and uh, electromagnetic impulses, right? Uh, to send messages across the country. And then of course, famously, most famous with the post office, right? Um, uh, the, the whole, um, the, the horse and mule services, right? The Pony Express. And oftentimes they were at increments of about 50 miles. They'd have a rider ride about 50 miles to the next post office Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, across, right? They had large bins at key uh, junctures in the Rockies and the Sierra Nevada, whereby people would put letters uh, for family members and federal uh, uh, employees of the post office service and/or military uh, would would grab those barrels and bring them back to the post offices to the east. So they tried to help facilitate such, okay, and encourage such in the 1840s. So it shouldn't surprise you, right, that, that, that for the first time, um, tens of thousands of Americans are going to travel across the overland trails in the 1840s. That was a big decade for westward expansion. And most famously, right, of course, were the, uh, uh, the, the uh, 49ers. In 1849 alone, uh, 80,000, 80,000, right, uh, registered across the, uh, the overland trails, 
those are just the ones that registered. And that didn't count those who went through the Panamanian Isthmus uh, and went other ways by sea, et cetera. All right. So this is all happening in the 1840s. And then of course, the Mexican-American War happened from 1846 to 1848. And you see there in red, right? We're gonna grab all that land from Mexico. So as for the Mexican-American War, most narratives uh, begin in Texas, as well as California. Those are the two areas, right? So if you'll indulge me here, what I wanna do is I will just separate this and center it because there's a lot of drama and I'll try to stick to the basic facts uh, regarding this war, all right? So firstly, goodness, where do I begin? Uh, let's start with Texas, right? It's known as Tejas y Coahuila. Uh, the state of Coahuila beneath our, our border to this day, right? Beneath Texas, uh, next to Chihuahua. Uh, it, it was connected to Texas uh, as a joint, um, as a joint department at first territory then department then state okay and so um so they had a combined legislator and so you had at the very beginning right uh issues of representation because texas was considered right because texas after all was you know about a thousand miles 900 miles from mexico city so it was considered like california uh, La Frontera, uh, the frontier, way out in the middle of nowhere, right? Because remember, uh, under the Spanish, um, up until the 1820s, uh, when Mexico broke free and in independence, uh, Texas too was very precariously held. Uh, the viceroy was technically in charge, uh, and again, down in Mexico City, and Texas was a long way away from there. So uh, with Coahuila, uh, for instance, Texas oftentimes, uh, even by the 1830s, um, had about, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, under 40,000 people registered in the census. And Coahuila had almost 90,000 people. So Coahuila greatly outnumbered Texas. And so they greatly outnumbered them uh, in as far as representation in their legislator. So it was, it, you were much more likely to be elected if you were from Coahuila uh, than you were from Texas. So there was that issue, right? Um, then uh, let's see here with Texas. I'm sorry, let me put this into a sub section because there are many subsections. All right, so you have the representation issue. Then in addition to that, um, you had uh, Mexican political turmoil at the national level, all right? So for instance, with this, right? You had a liberal federal republic declared in 1824, all right? And you also had an 1833 liberal constitution that went after, for instance, uh, the church and military. It was under a guy named Gomez Farias, and he was very liberal, and he he didn't like the privileged status of the of the Catholic Church. He broke up the missions uh, all all throughout Mexican territory, including Alta or Upper California, 
And um, there became, right, uh, a, um, a holy revolution, if you will, a conservative revolution that, that ousted him or a coup. So you had the 1824 and 1833 liberal constitutions, right? But then you had eighteen thirty two and eighteen thirty six, which you might call uber conservative constitutions. So if you looked up a guy named Bustamante, and then if you looked up, of course, Santa Ana, right? So Bustamante, um, it was contested who won for president uh, versus a guy named Vicente Guerrero. And Guerrero, right, was a, quote, mulatto. He was, uh, uh, he was, he was Spanish and African in origin, right? And that scared the conservatives. Um, he flirted with ideas like land redistribution for the poor, uh, uh, getting rid of the Ansan regime of all institutions, right, that the Enlightenment was opposed to, like a privileged church, right, and, and, a, and a union of church and state, of, um, of a standing army and privileged military caste, right? Uh, he was against all of that. So it was seen to be a radical threat. So Bustamante engaged in an outright civil war uh, over the contested election and defeated, uh, militarily defeated Guerrero and had him publicly executed. So you could argue, right, that Mexico's um, history is, is especially contentious. Um, you could look up a guy named David Wasserman's book, W-A-S-S-E-R-M-A-N, Everyday Life in, in, in uh, 19th Century Mexico. And uh, he gives stats as far as how many uh, revolutions and scrapped and changed constitutions there were, um, how many civil wars there were, how many coups there were. Remember a coup, C-O-U-P, is a blow to the state, right? So whereby there's not necessarily revolutionary change in the structure of government, but one group uses force uh, to overthrow another. And so, but there, there were a lot, there were a lot. I apologize, I don't remember the exact number. Uh, but, but definitely pretty tumultuous in Mexico, right? And why am I saying this? Is it's going to make them vulnerable, right? It's going to make their frontier vulnerable because they, they got bigger fish to fry. They're, they're, they're fighting one another. There, there's contest. We, the Americans could easily take advantage of, of this, um, this weakness of theirs, this distraction of theirs, of political instability at the national level. So, uh, and by the way, the 1836 constitution of Santa Ana is going to be the one that is officially um, uh, rebelled against in Texas, uh, primarily by the Anglo uh, Texans, right? As opposed to the Hispanic Texans known as Tejanos. Um, and they're gonna contend that they are wanting the return of the 1824 constitution the liberal federal republic, right? That gave the states and local governments, you know, limited uh, self-government, uh, autonomy to do their own thing, constitutional safeguards and rights. So for instance, to, to illustrate how kind of uber conservative the 1836 constitution was under Santa Ana, right? Uh, he gave himself power uh, to uh, dissolve uh, Congress at will. Right, that, that, that's a big strong executive power as far as checks and balances go, right? Uh, he did not need approval for his cabinet members. He called the states his departments and he insisted that he had the right to pick the governors instead of having them elected by their legislators or by the people themselves from state to state as, was, as had been happening, right? So, uh, you know, he also reestablished a standing army with, and, and gave uh, the fueros, uh, right? Like if something is fuero de algo, if something is outside of something, you're, you're considered, you know, uh, outside the system. Uh, these fueros, F-U-E-R-O, uh, the military and the clergy had them under Spain so that they could get away with things that other people could not do. 
if they were uh, indicted or charged with some type of, of criminal activity, they were to be tried by their own estate, uh, clergymen by the church hierarchy, uh, military personnel by the military tribunals instead of by a civilian court or judge. And of course, the liberals hated that because they felt like it just, it, it, it smacked a privilege of an, of an aristocracy, if you will, and, and was unfair as far as accountability of rulers. So at any rate, it, it was pretty conservative. And so that's what those in Texas are gonna contend at any rate, all right? So you have uh, political turmoil at the national level. Then you're going to have, right, um, an American, right, slash, I'm being kind of silly here, right? A gringo colony uh, permitted at Austin, okay? So at Austin, first it was Moses, and then it was his son, Stephen. They were given the title impresario. As an impresario, right? They were granted a certain amount of, of, of um, they were called hectares. They were on the metric system. Uh, but when you, when you translate it to our system of, of acreage, uh, it was incredible. Uh, the amount of acreage that was given to this colony, uh, in particular to the impresario as a person, and then, of course, there was an allotment uh, that oftentimes, you know, uh, uh, guaranteed a certain percentage of acres, right, uh, to the um, to any person, any American willing to come and settle into um, into this Austin territory, right? So they were to be granted, and I believe I have it in the write in the write up because I don't have it immediately at my disposal. But I also know I have it on a PowerPoint where I give exact numbers of acreage. And it's very, very generous. Generous land allotment. So they literally gave the land to them. Uh, a um, temporary tax exemption. I can't remember how many years, if it was like two years or up to five years, but they were given at least two years, I believe. Uh, I don't think any more than five uh, in which they were to be exempted from paying taxes, right? So notice they're being induced, right? They're being, um, you know, uh, convinced, uh, uh, you know, uh, courted by the Mexican government uh, to come and live in this area. So there's generous land allotment. There was temporary tax exemption. Uh, there were uh, also uh, full citizenship rights. Provided that they conduct business publicly in Spanish, so learn the Spanish language, become baptized as Catholic Christians, and obey the laws of Mexico and of Coahuila and the state of Coahuila y Texas, right? So as long as they perform the latter part, uh, they were granted all of these inducements uh, to come live in the Austin colony. I have a question. Sure. Do you think that it, they would be these like values only if they were to like subject to like converting to Christianity? Like, let's say if you were like, um, a Native American living there, would it still like exempt you from like all the taxes and like all those um, good parts if you weren't like as a Christian? That's a great question. The, the Spanish, right? They had started a precedent with slaves that, that you do not find in English America. Um, okay, Rudy. Um, 
but they established a precedent of, of subjectship by religion. Uh, and that whole, you know, that kind of ties into the black legend. You got to be considerate of that, whereby, you know, the enemies of Spain are going to exaggerate how religiously, no problem, Claire, uh, how, how religiously zealous the Spanish were, right? But, but it, the facts are the facts. Is the Spanish, right, like at uh, Fort de Mose in Florida, uh, they're going to grant slaves freedom and protection of citizenship rights, provided that they simply convert uh, to Catholic Christianity. With the natives, right, I believe, uh, and shame on me for not knowing this, but, but um, there were certain privileges and protections given to you if you were a, um, an assimilated uh, Native American. So for instance, the first uh, cabildos, the first city councils, right, in Los Angeles, in San Jose, and these other pueblos up here in Upper California, as they called it, right? Um, there were people who were biracially Black and Spanish. There were people who were Native American, uh, right? And they had, they not only had the full rights of citizenship, but they actually even participated in the cabildos, even served as political leaders in these city, in these city councils. And it primarily emanated from their decision to assimilate and become Catholic Spaniards, right, or Mexicans after 1824, and so, um, so yeah, I, I think that 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 area was there. Now, areas in which there were missionaries, then they remained in kind of a dependent, uh, you know, paternalistic relationship, right, with the Spanish friars, with their benevolent father figures who took care of them. Uh, but basically mandated every aspect of their daily lives. They couldn't leave the missions without permission, right? And were hunted down if they did. And so it, it just depended on each region. Um, in Texas, at one time, there were uh, Franciscan missionaries, uh, especially with the Caddo Native tribe, C-A-D-D-O. Um, but uh, they largely failed because of disease. Uh, the Cotto were written down in the primary sources as having been very um, amenable to the missions, uh, open to them, open to religiously converting, but they just simply died in large numbers. And so for that and other reasons, the Franciscan movement just kind of dwindled. So yeah, I would say that if, if you acted independently, uh, there was a lot of wiggle room in Spanish society, right? Uh, remember, uh, as early as by like 1519, uh, there were miscegenation laws uh, issued by Ferdinand uh, of Aragon uh, back in Spain, where he allowed legally, uh, you know, Spaniards, peninsulares and criollos, uh, to marry uh, mestizo and even indigenous women, etc. Uh, and and even for that matter, under the law, quote negros, African Americans, and so, um, uh, you know, and you, we also talked about evidence of uh, of of slaves being able to uh, freely uh, work part-time in or near the Spanish American cities and to uh, buy their freedom. And they had a lot of freedom of movement in their lives and their personal and professional and public lives. And so, yeah, I would make the argument that, um, that the Native Americans, and I'm sorry, because I've read you know, a decent degree on this subject of Anglo and Hispanic relations, but I've not done my due diligence uh, thinking about your question, uh, as far as the the indigenous, the natives of Texas, and I apologize, uh, but the the one exception, right, to what I'm saying, of course, were the quote hostile tribal members, uh, the members of the tribes, and of course the primary tribe in Texas that got a lot of negative publicity uh, down in Mexico City and in Saltillo, Coahuila, where the legislator and the state government met, uh, were the Comanche. Uh, the Comanche were uh, very often uh, fighting uh, with the Spanish and then later Mexican governments and, and opposing um, their infiltration into their lands. They were opposing uh, the missions. They were opposing any type of um, you know, integration. They didn't want to integrate and join with Hispanic society and institutions. So needless to say, they were treated as hostiles uh, by the Spanish and later Mexican governments at virtually every level you know, local, state, and federal. But, um, but again, 
if you were just a, you know, an indigena, just a person that happened to be of indigenous blood and you had assimilated, especially as a Roman Catholic religiously, um, I, I see especially in California, uh, evidence that you were freely allowed to integrate. Uh, so did I answer your question at all? Uh, yes, you did. Thank you. No problem, Josh. Okay. And so, um, yeah, so something to think about. And then uh, let's see here. If you don't mind me going back to this, to our notes. Um, so let's see, the colony was allowed to stay there, right? And to be established. So then you had some, uh, some, uh, points of, uh, of conflict, right, of tension. So for one, um, you had opposition uh, to specific national uh, leaders, right, and constitutions. Because remember, like I said, in Mexican political history, uh, you know, that I, I would make the argument that their um, their gap right between their left and their right on the political spectrum was broad. Uh, th those on the left wanted land redistribution. They wanted democratic government. Uh, they wanted to get rid of everything of the Ansan regime. Uh, you know, uh, they were further to the left. They wanted to abolish slavery. They wanted a, a universal citizenship, at least for men. So men of all colors and ethnic backgrounds, right? Which was way ahead of the Americans above them uh, geographically. And then uh, on the right, you had people that were, you know, quasi almost monarchists uh, with, you know, the, the use of, 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 of power uh, uh, carried out by, uh, first you had Augustine de Iturbide. Uh, Iturbide claimed himself as emperor Iturbide. That was their first leader after independence. Um, Guadalupe, uh, uh, what is it? Um, Guadalupe Victoria? Is it Guad Mario? No, Guadalupe Victoria. Their, their second president, at any rate, the one who had Vicente Guerrero. Oh, Anastasio Bustamante, I'm sorry. He shut down oppositional press. He gave the fueros back to the clergy and the military. He engaged in a civil war against his opponent and had him publicly executed, right? That's how far to the right he was. And then, like I said, Santa Ana, I'd, I've already gone over what Santa Ana did and, and serving as kind of the spark for the American independence movement in Texas, right? The whole Alamo and all that. So you had opposition to specific national leaders and constitutions. You had uh, the famous Fredonian revolt. And at the Fredonian Revolt, right, uh, these brothers, um, they, uh, they tried to establish their own American colony uh, free from Austin. Because remember, Austin, right, was a, a, a semi-autonomous region within Texas and Coahuila. And they wanted to be completely autonomous. So they established the Fredonian Revolt. Now, what's interesting is some of the Anglos, right? Some of the Anglo from English ancestry, right? Uh, remember, a lot of them were Southerners coming from Texas. Uh, I'm sorry, coming from uh, Tennessee and Kentucky, coming from nearby Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. So a lot of them, right, they carried with them Southern Jeffersonian rhetoric uh, that big government, don't tread on me, right? I'm going to do my thing, and I don't want government intervention in it. Uh, so with the Fredonian Revolt, uh, many of the Southerners uh, that had moved to Austin were for that idea. Um, you also had um, Stephen Austin himself, who claimed to be very cosmopolitan, right? Can, can uh, you know, abided by that which was asked of the Anglos in that region, uh, tried to keep law and order. Uh, amongst the Americans there, um, he helped um, uh, squash this, this rebellion. And he raised a considerable number of Anglo settlers to help him do so. 
So notice the Anglos during the Fredonian Revolt were split. Some were for uh, revolting for independence, and some of them were for staying loyal to the Mexican government. And as you can imagine, a lot of them uh, who stayed loyal uh, used the term gratitude, right? Because after all, they had been induced by some very generous offers uh, to, to live there to begin with. So then uh, in addition to the Fredonian Revolt, um, you had uh, tax issues at Anahuac. Okay, and so uh, at Anahuac, right, uh, a, lot of, a lot of these Southern gringos did not wanna pay taxes. And eventually, I believe it was two years, uh, but the short duration, right, the, or, or arguably long duration, of tax exemption finally came to an end. So like anybody else, like the, the Tejanos, the, the Hispanic Texans, they now had to pay taxes. And there literally were revolts at Anahuac about it. There was a guy named John Bradburn Davis, uh, called himself Juan Bradburn Davis, as emblematic of his decision to assimilate to Hispanic culture, right? And he is going to demand that the other gringos pay their taxes. And when they don't, he's going to tell on them to the Mexican authorities and ask for the troops to enforce his right uh, to collect their taxes. There are gonna be attacks and threats on his life. And as you can imagine, some of these libertarian, rebellious, uh, not to mention you guys, there was a decent criminal demographic in this population. Literally people who were running away from American law uh, for a crime having committed and fled into Texas. And then let's face it, also racist uh, Anglos considered Juan Bradbird Davis uh, a sellout to them, right? And a kiss up to the Mexican government as they also at the time of the Fredonian revolt thought of their leader, Stephen Austin. And so at any rate, you had that issue. And then you had uh, Mier y Terran's um, commission when he came right uh, up into Texas on behalf of the Mexican government, he was just to basically write down and report uh, the state of things. And when you look at his report, it's very kind of present, right? Like it's telling of the future and it's very cynical and sad as he says, right? First of all, there was a reality. I kid you not. I might be a little off on my numbers, but not much. There were like four to 6,000 Hispanics in Texas, uh, Tejanos, and there were like 30,000 Anglos. And he said, my goodness, we're going, if we don't change things, we're going to lose this colony. The Anglos here, he said, while there were reports that initially in the 1820s, they had abided by Mexican law and expectations. Now they are clearly uh, flagrantly uh, disobeying Mexican law. First of all, many of them owned slaves and the Mexican government had abolished slavery. They abolished the slave trade in the liberal constitution of 1824. And then by uh, the early 1830s under Gomez Farias' liberal government, they did away with slavery itself. And here they were bringing slaves with them and using them on their fields. Um, they were not paying taxes. They were not learning English and integrating and marrying Mexican women any longer like they were in the 1820s. He said, yes, they are uh, rather enterprising. A lot of them are starting, you know, uh, different mills and different, uh, you know, trade and so forth. But they're very, he said, haughty. And remember haughty, right, is that you're arrogant, you're defiantly arrogant, that the, the, the rules don't apply to you because you're above them somehow. So he warned that something needs to be done, right? So the conservative government of Bustamante, right, initiated uh, the April 6th colonization law. And this stated, right, no slaves, those defiant of Mexican law are to be deported and no further 
uh, gringo immigration into Texas. So now they're cracking down, right? Under this April 6th law, this colonization law, okay? Uh, at the beginning of the 1830s. So there's plenty of conflict going on, right? So then Stephen Austin travels to Mexico City and drama ensues over um, or in or let's say drama ensues via by way of right um, gringo conventions committees and militia units all right and they are going to be ironically here right they're going to insist on slavery they're going to insist on local autonomy, and they're going to insist on immigration. So supposedly Stephen Austin comes down to Mexico City. He meets with Gomez Farias, and they have kind of an ego clash. And he tells Gomez Farias, if they don't accommodate on this April 6th law, the gringos are going to rebel. And by their numbers alone, uh, in their rebellious spirit, they're going to win, and they're going to take Eastern Texas from Mexico. Gomez Farias contends that um, he threatened treason and has Stephen Austin arrested. Austin was in prison for about a year and he is going to supposedly change from an accommodating gringo leader uh, to a rebel uh, in that time. He's going to send a famous letter, right? Austin's letter to the Cabildo, the city council of San Antonio de Bejar. And it's gonna basically say, uh, feel free to rebel. And then of course the ultimate uh, spark is Santa Ana's uh, conservative constitution. I don't remember if it was called the Siete Leyes, the Seven Laws, like an old Spanish constitution name. So at one point he had Siete Leyes as a name. Uh, you could also look up the uh, Bases Organicas, B-A-S-E-S-O-R-G-A-N-I-C-A-S. -S -S. Uh, if you look up those Spanish terms, uh, they'll give you the details of his liberal or of his conservative constitutions. He had two. And they were very conservative. But according, right, to Chicano historians, this new constitution was merely an excuse, a pretext. Finally, an excuse for the, the gringos in Eastern Texas to rebel and, and try to take that region from Mexico. So then, Perfecto de, Perfecto de Cos um, arrives with troops to uh, Presidios, Mexican military forts, right? And encounters armed resistance. The gringo rebels are going to liken themselves to Minutemen during the, quote, revolution. And contend right that that a part of their God-given rights and constitutional rights is the right to uh, assemble their own uh, locally grassroots organized democratic organized um, uh, militias, because under the, the the conservative constitution of Santa Ana, right, he would handpick a governor, and he would he automatically nationalized uh, the state militias. So now they're under the federal army. Because remember, under the US government, right? 
uh, Congress can only do that in the event of a rebellion or invasion. Otherwise, they're, they're autonomous. The militias are supposed to be at least semi-autonomous and under state control rather than federal control. So this was seen, right, as a, an infringement on their rights. So what they did is they went to the nearby presidios and they threatened by their superior numbers over the, uh, the Mexican troops uh, to, uh, to fight them. And in most cases, the Mexican troops uh, evacuated the presidios and they took them over. So Perfecto de Coast came to the presidios, right? And, uh, and ordered them to stand down and they refused. So a place, right, like uh, Goliad. And then of course, the famous Alamo. The rebels stayed there. So the governor of Zacatecas, he refused to step down under this new constitution, right, that, that gave um, uh, President Santa Ana the right to handpick the governors. He said, I've been chosen by the people of my state and I'm not, I'm not handing over my state militia. So Santa Ana sent an army into Zacatecas and crushed the governor's army, his militia. And he warned that he was coming to Texas next if they didn't step down. And of course they refused to step down right and by the way some of the leaders at this time right were uh i'm sorry i can't remember his first name but there was a mr henry there's a william barrett travis and then of course there was sam houston and they became associated with the term war hawks they adamantly insisted on uh on independence on rebellion against Santa Ana's army and new constitution. And also what makes things look bad, right, is virtually all three of them have quotes that are that 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 are that are very racist. So for instance, at the Alamo, William Barrett Travis will die at the Alamo. And uh, he sent out a circular or letter uh, to be sent back to the US <clears throat> asking for American volunteers to come back and fight against this backward civilization of Mexicans and uh, enhance, you know, good white Americana uh, into this, this beautiful heartland of, of Texas. So it, it was no longer, right? Uh, perhaps it never was, but it, uh, according to Chicano historians, but it was no longer just a, uh, a federal issue of state and local autonomy versus the national government's power, in particular, the executive's power, the president's, right? And their right to have slaves, et cetera. But now you have the added component of, of racism, of racist um, uh, tension. So what's interesting is you had a handful of Tejanos at the Alamo and then in particular, you had Juan Seguin, who helped lead the rebellion in Texas, and they were Tejanos. So it's interesting, right? Sadly, however, Juan and his son Erasmo Seguin are going to eventually leave Texas after independence because of racism that they encounter. And they felt disillusioned. Like at one time, they believed this was a political issue of state and local rights versus federal power. And they had become disillusioned with that notion and, and began to uh, increasingly see this as a, a, an Anglo-American movement against Hispanics. And then, you know, we're going on too much time here, but uh, the battle of, um, San Jacinto, um, won independence for the rebels. What they basically did is, you know, uh, kind of like in the in the um, uh, Sinzu's uh, Art of War, he said, you not only do you want to, um, uh, sometimes you want to appear. Uh, as weak and in those moments hit your enemy by surprise because they'll never expect it right so when was a moment of weakness when the three 
the three contingents of the Mexican army uh, that would that had been separate and, and you know separated for quite some time when they joined together at San Jacinto. The idea of Sam Houston was Santa Ana would never guess that he would be attacked once the three contingents of his army got together because they had such numerical superiority, right? And that's exactly what they did. Uh, the night, literally that, that day that they met, that night, uh, the, the Anglo, primarily Anglo rebel army attacked and surprised them. They captured Santa Ana under a famous tree in return for his life and freedom. Uh, he, uh, he signed over Texas to the rebels, all right? And needless to say, at the Alamo, there were about 200 people uh, and they were killed to a man. Uh, from uh, the last days of February uh, to March 6th, there was a siege of the Alamo by the Mexican army. And uh, in American press, right, uh, especially like Davy Crockett, who had been a, a congressman from Tennessee, and kind of a rags to riches, Jacksonian type figure, right? That was praised in his generation. Uh, they, they were increasingly seen as, uh, as martyrs and galvanized support for the rebellion. So from 1836 to 1845, uh, Texas was independent. The Lone Star State, right? And the Mexican Congress declared, if the American government ever tries to annex, right, tries to incorporate Texas as a new state, uh, it will, uh, the Mexican government will sever diplomatic relations and mobilize its army. It'll basically cause a war. And then, of course, you had uh, Presidents John Tyler. John Tyler is going to be kicked out by his own Whig party because he's going to be seen as a Democrat in disguise, as a Southerner, and be very pro-Democratic party and Southern uh, in his platform, right? And so he loses re-election, and he's a lame duck president anyway. He's on his way out, right? When he lost in November and he's got to wait till March to leave. And so he he asked Congress to annex Texas. And um, his predecessor, or his, uh, not his predecessor, uh, the subsequent uh, president, right? His successor, uh, James K. Polk, uh, followed up with it. And James K. Polk, right, he he constitutes in Chicano history, you know, the white devil. Uh, he came in and he made it clear he wanted California and he made no bones about it. We, uh, we said he had uh, attempts to purchase the West and those were not only turned down by the Mexican government, but they, they very much angered the Mexican government and they demanded that people like uh, Poinsett, who was one of the two who tried, uh, be removed from office and leave Mexico. They were so insulted by his offer uh, to purchase it. Then, of course, right, the adams onice Treaty, uh, the border between Texas and Mexico, right? was disputed by this new government. The Sabine or the Nueces River claimed by the Mexican government at different times versus right the Rio Bravo del Norte or we call it the Rio Grande. And it's ironic, right? You look at the enhancement of the border from the Sabine or the Nueces down to the Rio Grande to gain us just a little bit more territory. I read a Chicano historian who contended that is some of the most unproductive, lacking fertility soil in this country. So what's the point, right? Is some people contend that Polk was picking a fight, that he was picking a fight. But 
Then there was Mexican Alta California, right? I think he spelled it with a K. Uh, Lucas Graham, right? I'm going to put affairs. He's a, he's a, he was associated with one affair in particular, but he was involved in multiple things. He was a troublemaker. Uh, just to say it in an expedient fashion, he and other Tennessee uh, Anglos came into Mexican California, and they too were rebellious from the very beginning. Okay. There was an attempted coup in Monterey, California, uh, by sea, because supposedly uh, the captain said that he saw a um, a fabricated story in a Latin American newspaper that Mexico and the United States were at war, so that he thought we were at war. And so he came and, and, and attacked uh, the troops and the Mexican government in Monterey. And I'm sorry, I, I can't recall immediately his name, but I have it also on a PowerPoint, et cetera, that I could find for you, all right? You also had complaints by Sutter, Johann von Sutter, right? He was the Swiss impresario of the Sacramento Valley. And he was strategically placed there, right? Because that was where the gap in the Sierra Nevada mountains was. And, and the Mexican government rightfully assumed that that's where the gringos would come, right? Is through that pass. And they were absolutely right. Then you also have uh, publicized intrusions by Jedediah Smith. Remember, he's a mountain man, fur trapper. Well, in the 1840s, right, uh, these mountain men are going to become famous from their stories, right? And they're going to capitalize on this in more ways than one, but one way which was to become a, um, a tour guide, if you will, right? Or an immigration guide. And they would pay people uh, to lead them uh, into the West. Because after all, right, they had special relationships and, and uh, exemptions with Native American tribes that might be hostile to people they didn't know. They knew the, the correct path to take as far as shortcuts and the least dangerous routes. So Jedediah Smith was captured and um, they, they accused him of being an American spy and wanting to take Mexican California. Uh, and then John C. Fremont. Now, three times he came in through the Sierra Nevada into Sutter's territory, right? The first time he had papers with him. And like Lewis and Clark and Zebulon Pike, he was the leader of a topographical engineering crew for the U.S. Army. So they're literally wearing U.S. uniforms, right? And he had papers with him that stated he was just to uh, get together information on the West about its topography, its plant and animal life, et cetera. However, the second and third times, he did not have papers with him. He acted suspiciously. And the third time he was momentarily detained and even, um, uh, you know, detained, questioned, and even momentarily arrested by the Mexican governor before he was allowed to leave. Then instead of leaving directly eastwardly, he went up north through California, uh, uh, was surrounded by the army on a famous hill, uh, Hawks Hill, and um, threatened. they threatened to arrest him or even worse, fire against him. He promised he was leaving. He went up into the Oregon territory, right? And he met with a guy named Archibald Gillespie. Well, we have evidence now that Archibald Gillespie was acting as a U.S. spy in Mexican California, spying out the troops, it's where its forces were, in the event of war, capitalizing on Mexico's weakness 
uh, of political instability, of being sparsely populated, of having a lot of Anglos there uh, to try to uh, take it over. So he met with Archibald Gillespie in Oregon. And then, of course, you had the Bear Flag Revolt. And there were other figures, but arguably the most popular was Ezekiel Merritt. Maybe it's two T's. At any rate, they're going to contend, right, under this new bear flag that they are initiating, kind of like in Texas, their own Republic of California. What's suspicious about it even more than that, just the inherent, you know, rebellion itself, right? is that shortly after this rebellion, and by the way, they're gonna to go to the house in Petaluma of Mariano uh, Guadalupe Vallejo, who was in charge of the, the Mexican armed forces in California, and they're gonna put him under house arrest. And what do you know, John C. Fremont and his contingent of men in US uniforms comes down and takes Vallejo from these rebels and declares, he is under U.S. Uh, jurisdiction now. And by then, war had been declared because a battle had ensued uh, when Zachary Taylor and other forces were brought into that disputed territory between the rivers, arguably to pick a fight. And it worked. Mexican troops fired upon a cavalry unit of Americans, killed a handful of them. And so... Polk asked uh, the American Congress to declare war, uh, infamously stated that American blood has been shed on American soil. And by the way, according to two treaties, the adams onese Treaty and a subsequent one to that, I can't remember the name of it, uh, that was not the case. They were on Mexican soil. They were past the Sabine and the Nueces rivers, right? And they had lost their lives at the Rio Grande. So it all just smacks of American imperialism, just picking a fight to take this land from Mexico, right? Then Sloat, Stockton, these two gentlemen are, are in charge of the Navy. They're gonna come in uh, on the West Coast in large numbers and begin taking over uh, the major cities of Mexican California. Of course, Fremont and a guy named Kearney who came through New Mexico from the east. Uh, they're going to uh, take uh, California uh, cities. Los Angeles is going to put up a good fight. They're going to win it then lose it and be chased out, then win it again, and then declare martial law in Los Angeles against the Mexican citizens who uh, fought courageously against their occupation. And so things are ugly. All right. And so then, like I said, I, we could just go forever on this. It's just so, such a bite to chew off uh, for one week and one topic, antebellum Western expansion, is uh, then the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo takes this land from Mexico, but supposedly guarantees citizenship to Hispanics. Remember, Hispania was the name of Roman Spain, so that's a generic term often used, right? So people of Spanish ancestry. This happens on February 2nd, 
1848, right? Gold had been discovered, right, on January 24th. So talking about bad timing, right? Literally the last week of the war, last eight days of the war, right, or nine days, uh, gold is discovered at Sutter's Mill, where they try to, um, the, the Mormon laborers from a Mormon battalion who had fought in the Mexican-American War, served their time and were waiting for permission uh, from their leaders in Utah to come to Utah. And so for at that time, they were working as laborers in, in Mexican California, largely in Sutter's region. Uh, they they uh, split the American River in half uh, to uh, increase, or they they uh, they decreased it in half uh, to um, to increase the the pressure of the water uh, to better power a sawmill, and they found at the bed of the American River gold. So Governor Mason, uh, the later famous uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, right send a letter and gold to President Polk. Then Polk, right, publicizes the discovery, right, confirms it, that gold is there. And get this, he disregards the Northwest ordinances. Remember the Northwest West ordinances declare that there is a methodical process that has to be followed before a territory becomes a state, right? Because remember, this has just been one, so technically it's territory now, California. It has to go through this process to become added as annexed as a state. He pretty much, although he, you know, he doesn't make them automatic states, they're territories for now, but as far as the land survey office, they're supposed to put everything in six acre square plots, squares, decide on cities and counties, etc. cetera. Handpicked certain leaders during the territorial process. He pretty much skips all that and declares A mineral rush it says whoever can get there and claim the gold can have it. So this is going to add, right? This adds to Turner's narrative of a wild and open West. Any questions? What I'm going to do is the the four of you. I um, uh, I want to just cover the basics of the handout as quickly as I can because we're going on a long time here, and um, and then uh, I want to uh, give you guys extra extra credit those of you who have remained with me. So the others will still get their five points, but I'm going to give you guys ten. So going back to Turner's thesis, right? Was there available, attainable uh, mineral wealth and land in the West for the common person that may not have been available in the East? Yes, you can make that argument. So for instance, right, the disregard of the Northwest ordinance. You have an American political tradition, especially secured under Andrew Jackson's administration, right? And his time period just before this, is squatters rights. Right, whereby, why? I wonder if I could still, 
Okay. So squatters rights. If no one is inhabiting the land that you're on, right? There was a variation at every local state area, right? Sometimes uh, there'd be uh, an ultimatum given to the landowner and he or she would have to begin to cultivate that land or else the land would be available to per be purchased at market price by the squatter. Other areas, uh, the, in, in other areas, uh, the squatter had a right to compete for that land uh, in a bidding war. And I kid you not, in other areas, the squatter would be outright granted the landowner's land uh, for neglect. So because of squatter's rights, there were opportunities for the common man in the West. Mineral wealth, especially 1848, those who got there early, according to the newspapers, they, they, they became bonanza kings, right? Rags to riches stories of finding lots of gold and enriching themselves from it. However, the argument is, right, that by the, the middle of 1849, there was only a finite amount of gold to be discovered, and that was accessible to the common person with just a, simply a pickaxe, right, or, or a pan, and that also um, there were just too many people, not enough gold to go around, so that, like in most cases, right, the early birds got the worm. Entrepreneurial activities, they call it mining the miners. You could find a need or a demand from miners and take advantage of that need or demand. So something as simple as washing clothes, uh, cooking food, having a, um, an inn for them to stay like a hotel, uh, gambling houses, uh, entertainment theaters, right? Uh, sometimes even just um, carrying people's mail from one region to another and charging them a certain amount for each article. There were ways, uh, the Mormons, for instance, right, uh, enriched themselves off their ferrying business. Uh, they developed uh, ferry escort services across the dangerous rivers of the Oregon Trail and charged people, right, to use those ferries across the rivers and enrich themselves from that. Uh, the German immigrants who uh, in, in Western Pennsylvania who invented the Conestoga wagon and sold the wagons and the wagon parts made a killing. Samuel Colt and other gun manufacturers made a lot of money, right? And then, of course, after the Civil War, you get into the cattle and the uh, accessibility of the, of the wild roaming cattle and the money that could be made from that and the railroads coming in, but that's pertinent to, to 102 class chronologically, but it's used by Turner in his thesis because he wrote it in the 1890s. Now, literally in California, for instance, under territorial status, and in the mining regions, right? Sonora, in that area. Uh, technically for a while, there literally was no municipal uh, government. So the miners, they, so they, they began uh, ad hoc fashion to create miners associations, miners clubs, uh, which basically served as vigilante groups against claim jumpers, against thieves, right? And extortionists, against murderers and rapists. The newspapers are going to give accounts of this stuff, of wars in the mining districts between the mining associations and so-called, uh, you know, banditos and criminals. In places of New Mexico and other areas taken, uh, you're going to have towns like Baldwell and uh, Caldwell and Baxter, where they're going to they're going to grow tired of of people coming in. Uh, and taking advantage of this kind of, you know, uh, vacuum, the absence of Mexican institutions and the, uh, you know, the, the, the pre-era of American institutions. And they're going to, um, they're going to uh, 
deputize everybody in the town. I kid you not. And, and tell them that they have the right to shoot on spot uh, any criminals coming into their town. American judges, uh, you had one infamously known as the hanging judge all the way over in Oklahoma, are gonna send warrants along with their deputies and marshals uh, to uh, capture dead or alive uh, people that are getting their names and pictures in the newspapers for criminal activity. And then it's gonna be exacerbated by ethnic tensions when, when the criminal, the alleged criminal is Mexican, right? So the infamous Joaquin Marietta, right? Uh, Tiburcio Vasquez. Uh, later on, Chicano historians are gonna call them social bandits, kind of like Robin Hoods, that they had no trust. They couldn't, they could no longer rely on the Mexican institutions of government, church, uh, schools, et cetera, right? And that they were in the midst of this unjust war and unjust treatment at the end of the war. And so hence, they felt like they were sticking it to the system by robbing people and living a quote, criminal lifestyle, et cetera. Very interesting subtopic, all right? And notice this bottom part is Turner is gonna highlight the dangers, right? In romanticizing the meritocracy, saying, right? What, what romance is there in winning the West, right? And remember to him, inherent in his thesis is that it didn't matter how much money you began with. It didn't matter what your connections in the East were. Everybody supposedly started at the same level in the West because everything was quote, brand new. And so it was up to your talent, to your initiative, your intelligence, right? But also your toughness and your resilience. Because to him, it was all the more romanticized in the West if you could make it because of allegedly how dangerous and tough it was. Uh, you had a guy named Joseph Campbell. He writes about similarities of different cultures and literature and different civilizations. And he says, you find certain commonalities amongst them, the hero's journey. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? The man who makes it through all types of uh, hardships uh, before he touches success. And that's what you find in Turner's thesis. He likes that it was supposedly so dangerous and so tough and almost kind of adhering to Darwinism, social Darwinism, right? He writes in his work that the, the weak, the sickly, uh, uh, that they died out, okay? But remember, inherent in his thesis is the beauty of those who made it was that it didn't matter where they had begun. They could have started off as poor, obscure, and all they needed were the, the individual characteristics to succeed. Now, oppositional data. There's evidence that the majority of mineral wealth throughout Western mineral rushes, including the gold rush, was eventually extracted by corporations that had the pneumatic and hydraulic drills and very expensive machinery to get hundreds of feet into the caves, into the mountainsides to extract most where most of the wealth resided, the minerals, right? And so hence the common guy with his pickaxe didn't stand a chance. He also states that with farm equipment, uh, the mechanical reaper, the thresher, the harvester combine, those are super expensive. You could afford them as a cash crop farmer in the West. You could outproduce your smaller scale farmers and sell your stuff more successfully and at a cheaper price than your smaller competitors. So hence capital helped. And then of course, when you get into 102 chronology, later on after the Civil War, the railroads and the political capital that they had, right? They got a lot of help from the federal government, <clears throat> but we won't get into that. Then against, arguably against Turner's thesis is what about popular prejudices and discrimination toward Asian Americans, toward Hispanic Americans, toward women, limiting what they could or could not do. So hence the foreign miners taxes, right? exacted by the new uh, gringo uh, state government of California in 1850 and 1852, gave special taxes that had to be paid by Hispanic and Asian uh, gold miners, right? Um, you have a, a book called Our America 
by Felipe Armesto. And uh, he has evidence after evidence of just downright popular prejudice and, um, and, and popular violence against Hispanics in the West during and at the end of the Mexican-American War, uh, bullying them off their lands. Also in the courts, right? You had to prove as an Hispanic landowner the exact coordinates with latitude and longitude of your property. They wanted a signature and date of the governing authorities as to who had granted your ancestors that land. If you could not adequately prove it, then they did not recognize it in the court. Also in California and in New Mexico, uh, there were Spanish grandees, right? Or the ants, the, the, uh, those who had come from them, right? Uh, who, um, who owned large tracts of land. So like the Nietos down in LA uh, family, et cetera, owned thousands and thousands of acres. Well, a lot of them also did not engage in agriculture primarily, but were still uh, you know, pastoral had sheep and cattle. So in roaming that land, right, it, it didn't look at any given time, it wasn't evident to American squatters if or whom, who uh, owned that land. So they would just squat on that land. But on paper, right, that belonged to a, uh, an Hispanic grandee miles away. So they'd take it to court and sometimes the judge would decide, right, being a racist judge. Also remember judges were largely elected by this time. So they wanted to make popular decisions. And because of the gold rush, gringos are gonna immediately outnumber the Hispanics, largely. So it was more popular for the judges to decide in favor of the gringo squatters and say, well, I see that it's, on, it's part of your land, but you haven't improved it. You haven't cultivated it. And so I'm gonna grant this person the right to purchase it at market price, or I'm gonna grant it to this squatter outright. And it varied from case to case until state law had kind of established precedence. All right. And then in some case, unscrupulous Anglo lawyers came in, ostensibly defended their Hispanic clients, but then demanded so much in attorney fees that the Hispanics had to, had to uh, uh, hand over as collateral as their inability to pay for the attorney fees portions of the very land that the lawyer was defending in court. So under a myriad of different ways, Hispanics, you know, did not retain a lot of their land and did not retain the rights of citizenship by, um, the, by way of the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which on paper, that was to be guaranteed, right? Their citizenship rights, and in particular, their property rights. Okay, and then one more term, if you will, used oftentimes in these histories is proletarianization. A uh, gentleman's name, uh, um, Eber and De Leon, wrote this on Hispanics in the West, their book, and it, it has become a popular term, is that Hispanics, right? Not legally, but just informally. Not it's it wasn't written down in actual law, but it didn't have to, because it was so successful uh, in being implemented. Is that the Hispanic population was pigeonholed into the proletariat? And remember, the proletariat is Karl Marx's manual labor, working with their hands, population right demographic, in an industrializing society. So farm laborers, uh, factory workers, right? Uh, domestic workers, uh, service laborers like cooks and cleaners, right? That Hispanics by and large became pigeonholed into those jobs that didn't offer much of a future as far as promotion and income and other economic opportunities to become more independent economically that were certainly not held to be prestigious or coveted by many people, right? And so hence that term, proletarianization. And then if that's not bad enough, in actuality, stereotypes 
were disseminated that that supported like, kind of like the Sambo image that supported slavery. There were stereotypes that supported this proletarianization fact that stated, right, that Mexican people, and I love this with stereotypes. I'm saying this ironically, right, sarcastically. I love how oftentimes stereotypes are riddled with contradictions. On the one hand, there were stereotypes that Mexicans were lazy, good for nothing, uh, thieves, couldn't be trusted, uh, would try to rape white women. Then you also had the uh, stereotype that they were the ideal laborer, right? Go figure, the juxtaposition of those two. That that's where they belonged, was working with their hands, that they were not intelligent, not enterprising, and hence needed to stick with what they knew as workers in agriculture, as our gardeners and domestic um, maids, cooks and cleaners, factory workers, etc. All right. So how did Hispanics respond to that? Some resigned to it and they insulated themselves into their own culture, right? So they preserved their culture very well. And I need you to remember that for the test. Despite being marginalized, kind of pigeonholed into the proletariat, Hispanics maintained Hispanic culture very well. <clears throat> All right. Um, but some of them fought within the system and some fought outside the system and some did a little bit of both. So what do I mean by fighting within the system? Some continued to try to use their numbers in places and cities, particularly like um, Tucson, Arizona, Santa Fe, New Mexico, San Antonio, Texas, uh, for a while, Los Angeles, California, and try to elect fellow Hispanics, right? That would, uh, that would be cognizant of their needs. Some, like the Armijo family in New Mexico, are going to do very well for themselves economically within the system. They're going to maintain and establish successful businesses, sometimes in competition with Anglo corporations and sometimes in cooperation with them. Okay. Uh, supposedly, uh, a strong, educated, bourgeois middle class of Hispanics existed. Uh, in San Antonio, Texas, for instance, for quite some time, in Santa Fe, New Mexico as well. And then some are going to fight beyond the system, right? And you have cases of social banditry. Uh, so Gregorio Cortina in New Mexico, Joaquin Marietta in California, right? Uh, sometimes they're going to engage in banditry, like uh, going into where these big corporate cattle ranchers come in and buy up all the land and they're gonna cut their barbed wire fences and take their sheep or their cattle and try to disseminate it to the poor Hispanic communities, et cetera. So some are gonna fight beyond the system as well, right? Um, so yeah, as far as the test goes, I think we have finally covered the material. Uh, any questions or comments? So then, is our assignment this week going to be a test, or is it going to be the argumentative essay? Or it's both? going to be the argumentative essay, yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure that when I cover each week, that I'm not only covering uh, context to the assignment, but also to that which will be on the next test, right, that's pertinent to this topic. Thank you. No and then problem. also, will you be posting this video? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, as soon as I can, sure. I have a question. Sure. So when are you going to be posting the argumentative assignment? Uh, pretty much as soon as this video downloads. Yeah, I have to wait till the video downloads. Sometimes it takes up to an hour and I apologize, but as soon as it downloads, I'll post this assignment. Okay, sorry okay. about that. Thank you. No problem. All right, so let me get your names to give extra, extra credit, if you will. I have a question. Yes. Um, sorry for like asking this, like, like this is not my first time asking this, but um, can I have like any like status about like the previous assignment? Like, I want to, 
I'm, I'm, I know it, it's getting to the point where it's embarrassing. I'm so sorry. Uh, I've just I've got to play catch up, and I I apologize. I really do. Um, I I don't want to make any false promises. Uh, but I I'm very much aware of that, and and I what I'm going to do also is I'm gonna um because be, I'm going to kind of triage because you guys are uh, your semester ends sooner than than the semester at, at my second school where I teach. Uh, I'm going to prioritize you guys first. So you guys are, are next on my list as far as catching up with grading. OK. Thank Sorry you. about that. No problem. No, it's OK. Here. OK, so um. Any other questions, you guys? Before we we finally call it quits, it's a it's been a two hour video, and so you've definitely earned your ten points. And I hope I've helped. I just wanted to say that I sent you a Canvas message, and I don't know if you've seen it yet because I sent it last week and I haven't gotten a response. No, if I if I haven't responded yet, I just I'm I'm behind because yeah, okay. if, if, if when I read it, I will certainly respond, Caitlin. I'm sorry. No worries. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you guys for your patience. All right. You've earned your 10 points today. I hope this facilitates this assignment and also your taking of test three with this material. All right. And I, like I said, thank you so much. All right. So have a good week. Okay, guys. Thank you. Thank you.